Nam, Tulsi, Bala, family and staff of Aravind, guests and friends. It is really a great honour for me to be with you today and I thank you for the invitation to come to the inauguration of the new Aura Lab. A lot's already been said and I can imagine you are quite tired and hot and would like a drink so I will not speak for more than one hour. <laughs> a lot has been said about vision. The vision of Aravind to eliminate needless blindness. The vision of Dr. V at the beginning of Aravind. And I ask the question, how do you get vision? On the one side, vision is the ability to see. We are born with it we can see. But vision is more than that. Vision is also the ability to see what might be. The ability to see a better future. The ability to see how one can change. So how do we get that vision? And if I think about it, I think probably there's three components. And as I talk, I want to think about those components as it relates to today. I think the first component is that we do have to use our heads, our intelligences, our intellect. And what we have to do is we have to learn from the past. We have to look at what has gone and see how things change so that we might change things for the future. We have to use our intelligence, but that's not enough. Besides using our intelligence, and again we've heard of it today, we have to use our hearts. There has to be a passion that desires change and that will not let obstacles get in the way. And thirdly, besides using our head and our hearts, there has to be the sense of seeking what the Almighty wants of our lives. It's not just about us. It's about the sense of a better world. And what does God want from us in this world today? So those are the three components, and now let's think about that as we think about why we're here today. And I want to start with using our intelligence, and what can we learn from the past? In 1976, that's 30 years ago, Dr. V retired. An elderly gentleman, having finished his professional work, Time to go home, put your feet up and rest. I think the story we know is totally different. He used his life's experiences as an ophthalmologist, the passion in his heart and the call he had from the Almighty to start Aravind. In 1976, the World Health Organization launched the Prevention of Blindness program the same year. In 1976, there were 30 million blind people in the world. In 1976, there were 6 million blind people in India. And at that time, India was only doing one or 200,000 cataract operations. 15 years later, 1991, Dr. V, with others, makes the decision, we will build Auralab. Did he make that decision for commercial reasons? No. He made that decision because he said, poor people should have the best quality eye care. And the best quality eye care is an intraocular lens. And the intraocular lens costs $300. And we can't afford that so we will make it for two dollars. That was the passion, together with his intelligence and looking to others, that in 1992 started Aura Lab. 
Around that time, the number of people blind in the world had increased to over 40 million. It was increasing by one million people every year. Today, blindness is on the decrease. Today, there are an estimated 37 million blind people in the world. The projected figure was 57. So we actually have 20 million blind people less than projected. Why? The why is because of the vision. The vision that used intelligence and passion to make sure that eye care services reached the people of Madurai. And then the people of Tamil Nadu. And then didn't stop but moved on to influence the national government of India. And did not stop at India, but as we heard before, has now gone all over the world with more than 100 countries in the world using the intraocular lenses, but more than just the intraocular lenses, using the model developed by Aravind, using the training provided by Aravind, people all over the world who have been touched by the work of Aravind and what's been done here. So that's what we can learn from the past. We can learn that in three decades, you can change the world. You can change the vision, the sight of the world. Instead of 57 million blind, there are 37 million. Have we won? No. Are we winning? Yes. Is there more to do? Yes. And we have to do more until the vision, elimination of needless blindness is accomplished. So what of we, and I now look at me as an outsider, have learned from Aravind over that 30 year period that we can use going forward. The first thing is we've learned about high volume, low cost, good quality services. And the fact that the three can go together. I have to say in my years in Africa, I always thought of high volume, low cost. But the concept that you could provide low cost and still make it high quality was something I learned here. The three can go together, high volume, low cost, high quality. Secondly, we've learned about planning and management. Not just ophthalmology, but how to organize yourself, how to become effective and efficient. The third thing we've learned is about innovation and technology. Oral Lab is one example, but there's many others. And today I was visiting a diabetic screening camp in a village using satellite technology. Aravind is always looking for the innovation and the technology, the next step. But now I pause because I want to talk about what we've seriously learned. And that is we've learned a kind of way of life. And I want to put it in these words because it was something I experienced a few years ago, but it kind of summarizes it the best I can think of. The first is when you look at Aravind and the people of Aravind and the way it works, there is an honesty about it. There is a transparency. There is a straightforwardness. You know they don't lie or cheat. You know they're not going to deceive you. They are honest. And I'm afraid a lot of our world is not honest. And part of that honesty, when we are really honest with ourselves, and we begin to understand and become aware of ourselves in the context of the world and our universe is a sense of humility. We are very small. In history, we are a drop. In the universe, a molecule. There is a humility within Aravind that translates itself to others 
who may have done a lot less but think of themselves much more. And as we put that honesty and humility together, we begin to experience a humanity that brings us close to Almighty God and in that sense, holiness. And I don't use that word lightly. But Aravind is more than about technology and ophthalmology and so on. There is a spirituality, a holiness that is in this place coming from that honesty and humility and humanity shown in its passion. And that's what external people have learned, particularly Westerners, because it's not easily seen in our culture today in the Western world. So having looked back, having thought, what do we learn today? We have to look to the future. And that, of course, is the challenge, but that really is vision. What is the vision for the future? What is the vision for Aravind? Here is a new factory now with new things to do. And what is the vision for ourselves if we are interested in this type of work? I will put it in two ways, and one is a real challenge which is personal for me, and I say it because I feel it, and maybe it will bear seeds somewhere, and maybe even seeds here. There are today 37 million blind people in the world, and that's far too many. And around 15 or 17 million are just waiting for a cataract operation to see tomorrow. And we still have a lot to do. But there are 500 million people with disability. There are many more who are deaf and physically impaired and have mental impairment. And it's not sufficient just to stop with sight and vision. We have to go further. So if I am a blind child born in a village of Tamil Nadu, I may consider myself fortunate compared with a deaf child. Because I will get services from Aravind. But who will give the services to a deaf child or a child born with club foot or cleft lip? Who are going to look after those children with disability? So vision for the future, a world where we are dealing with all disabilities. And either providing the medical care to prevent and treat, or the education to improve the quality of life together with rehabilitation. And lastly, in my final word, I wonder because I believe there is a purpose in life I wonder why was I born in England why did I get to go to school why could I go to university why could I experience a good life when two billion people live in abject poverty is there a God if the world is like that But I also believe in a God. And then I ask myself, why? And I think I experience part of the answer. I have two grandchildren. I have three children, but I ignore them. I have two grandchildren. One is five and one is three. And they were in my house. And I had a packet of sweets one packet of sweets and I thought okay I take this packet of sweets I open it and I divide it in two and I give half the sweets to Archie and half the sweets to Lottie because that's safe and then I decided no I won't do that I will give the whole packet to Archie and I will say to Archie, please share that with your sister. Now think about the two scenarios. 
If I divide it in half, each takes their half, each goes to a corner of the room, and each begins to eat their sweets, in silence, alone. If I give it to Archie, I start a dialogue. I start a partnership. I start a relationship that is going to go on and on all their lives. I start the idea of giving and being given to, of receiving. It is a totally different situation into which love can come. When I divide it in half and separate them, work and love enter. It's all about selfishness. And so God does create our world and he does give to some and he asks those to share with those who don't have and that's the challenge to all of us we have to use our intellect to learn from the past we have to use our heart to have passion we have to look to God for what we are meant to do and I thank Dr. V and the family of Aravind that for 30 years they have been sharing their sweets with the rest of the world. Thank you.